There are six more chances to watch Ellie De La Cruz Great American Ballpark this year. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Reds. My name is Jeff Carr, and I am a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fan, and I've been talking about the Cincinnati Reds on this podcast daily for the last six years. Locked On Reds is for everybody. We want to talk about the biggest thing going on in Reds country every single day, all throughout the year, regular season, uh, spring training, off season, all of it in between. We're going to be here with you every single day. Make sure you're subscribed to get 30 minutes of Reds content daily from us here at the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your team every single day. And I'm happy that you're alongside me here today because with the last Reds homestand of the year, we're going to look back on 2024 and why Great American Ballpark was more of a home field disadvantage for the Reds than it was any sort of help. We are also going to look at what to expect from the homestand. There's still lots to look for, lots to watch for, lots with the long ball, a little bit with the pitching, some with Noel V. Marte. But, of course, we're going to start first with the things that Ellie De La Cruz can accomplish in this homestand. That's all on today's Lockdown Reds podcast that is brought to you by FanDuel. Because now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get three weeks free of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And where we will get started today is with Ellie De La Cruz because he's got a lot that he can accomplish in this homestand. He's had a very good season, but it can be a special season with a little bit of work because the Reds have only had three 30, 30 seasons in the history of the franchise. Now, obviously, he's well past 30 steals. He's up to 64. Uh, and I have to look. I'm pretty sure the only other guy to ever go 30, 60 or more was Eric Davis. Don't think anybody else did this. But as far as 30, 30 goes, um, and well, and Eric Davis went 30, 50. So there you go. Nobody's ever gone 30, 60 in the history of the Reds. Uh, but Brandon Phillips in 2007 was 30 and 32. Barry Larkin in 1997 was 33 and 36. And then Eric Davis, something about the sevens. Eric Davis in 1987 was 37 and 50. That's it. That's the list. And, and Ellie could have a chance here with just six more homers to be on that list. Now, there's only 11 games left. There's not a ton of time for him to really hit those six home runs. And quite frankly, if you just do a little bit of math, which <clears throat> I took my time before the show started to do this math, but if you do a little bit of math, you can see it probably won't happen unless he gets hot. He could get hot. Don't let Ellie get hot. But this season, he has had one homer for every 27 plate appearances. That's not exactly that great. That probably only means he hits like one homer in the final 11 games of the season, maybe two, but his best month, you got to go back to April, uh, for, for this, but during the month of April and those couple of games in March, he was hitting one home run for every 15 plate appearances, like 15.25 based on the math, but you can't have a quarter of a plate appearance. So let's just call it 15, one for every 15 plate appearances. That still doesn't give me a lot of hope that he's going to hit six home runs in the final 11 games. But, I mean, I, I, I don't want to doubt Ellie De La Cruz, all right? You doubt Ellie De La Cruz at your own peril, he could do it. But I, I, I would find that really cool. A 30, in his case, 30-60 season would be phenomenal. Could he get 30-70? In fact, let's think about that for a minute. We, the home runs have not necessarily been his focus this year, although the fact that he has hit the most homers on the team is not lost on me. That was not a guy that I was picking to do that. In fact, I picked CES to do that. That didn't happen for a number of reasons. But Ellie De La Cruz is leading the team in homers. But if he gets six more steals, because he has 24 homers, 64 steals. So if he gets six more steals, gets to 70, there's a couple of different things that he can do. Number one... And, and this is looking at the long game for a Reds player's career. He would top, he would be 45th all time on the Reds career steals list. And think about that. He only has one full year under his belt. 
one full year plus one, like two thirds of a season, one and two thirds of a season. And he'll already be 45th. If he gets six more steals, he'll tie Johnny temple for that. Johnny temple, uh, interesting. You know, he played second base for nine years back in the fifties. And quite frankly, the only comparison that I ever want to do with Johnny Temple and Ellie De La Cruz is the fact that, hey, Johnny Temple made three all-star games. But Johnny Temple was a singles hitter, pretty good batting average guy, but that was about it as far as his offensive profile is concerned. Wasn't a very hard hitter or anything like that. But I just found that interesting that career-wise, I mean, Ellie is just getting started. We're, we just got the first pitch off in his career, basically when it comes to some other guys. And with that being said, he's already jumping up the career list in stolen bases. So that's something he could do with just six steals. Here's what else he could do with six steals. He could become the first, uh, not the first, the uh, fourth, yeah, the fourth shortstop in the history of baseball to have at least 70 steals in a season. That's the history of baseball. That's for every team. You've only had... Three guys do it. Mari Wills for the Dodgers back in the 60s did it twice, and he had 104 steals in 1962. And then you also look at Jose Reyes back in 2007 for the Mets. He had 74 steals, and Frank Tavares for the Pirates, he had 70 steals in 1977. But that's it. That's the list. The things that Ellie is doing with his speed on the base paths, and this is why he goes all the time. And we talk about, you know, I would like to see him be a little bit more judicious with when he tries to steal the other day, he was thrown out on a pitch out by the Cardinals and the Cardinals, um, particularly the guy behind the plate was just horrible at throwing guys out. But because or, I'm, I'm sorry, not even the Cardinals, it was the twins, uh, Ryan Jeffers, the catcher for the twins. I'm getting the twins and the Cardinals mixed up in my mind. It's all running together. It's been a long season, guys. Sorry. Uh, but Ryan Jeffers had only thrown out 13% of the guys that he had tried to throw out. So that was like one of those things where, you're like, okay, you can run all day on this guy. And he tried to. The first two pitches, he went. Both of those first two pitches were foul balls. And then with an 0-2 count on Tyler Stevenson, they decided, you know what, we're going to pitch out. We're going to play in this pitch out. He's going to try to steal second. We'll throw him out. And that's exactly what happened. It's kind of difficult because with a guy like Ellie, you want to be aggressive all the time. You want to run all the time because you can beat anybody. But if maybe like there's like one time or something, like think about that, that modified pitch out and um, you, you throw a ball to Tyler Stevenson, extend his at bat, Ellie stays at first, he's still there. That could be interesting. I don't know. I, I just think that there's a lot of easy analysis and easy overthought that you can put into Ellie De La Cruz's game. And when it comes to that, I would be interested to see how it's tweaked a little bit next year. But all that suffices to say, what he is doing is phenomenal. He could be just the fourth shortstop in the history of baseball to get 70 steals. And then if you look at the Reds' single season marks, modern era, there are a lot of 1800s players that stole a lot of bases. So I'm talking about after 19, we're talking about the World Series era of baseball. So 1904 and beyond. But Bob Besher, back in 1911, Bob Besher actually stole a lot of bases for the Reds in the early 1900s. But in 1911, he had 81 steals. But you had Eric Davis in 1986 with 80. You had Dave Collins in 1980 with 79 steals. You had Besher again twice. 1910, he had 70 steals. 1912, he had 67 steals. Then Joe Morgan twice in 73 and 75 with 67. So seriously, if, if even if, if, if Ellie doesn't get the 70, say he just steals four more bags, he can jump up to a top five all-time season when it comes to steal, stolen bases in the modern era for the Reds. We're talking about history can be made by a dude who just got started. <laughs> think about that. And yes, I know there's so many people that are probably thinking, yeah, but what about the contract and this and that? And can they sign them long-term? I don't care about that. Reds don't have to worry about that for like four years. Let's enjoy the time that we got with them, at least for right now. Let's let the front office and all that. Let's let the people that actually can control that worry about that. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to enjoy watching them because Think about what he can do in the next four years in a Reds uniform. It could be the best four years that we've ever seen. 
because of how good he has just been this year. I, I think it's phenomenal. The, the stolen bases thing is phenomenal. The homers thing is phenomenal. I want to see Ellie do some things in this final home stand. And just because I know you're curious, because I was curious, the any record, like even counting the 1800s, the record for stolen bases in one season by a Cincinnati Red, Hugh Nickel back in 1887, he had 138 steals. And this was in a season that this dude hit 217. I don't even know how he must have been running on every single pitch and they didn't keep track of caught stealing back then. So I have no idea how many times he was thrown out, but that'd be interesting. Could, could Ellie ever beat that record? Yeah, that might be a little bit tough, but Hey, Ellie's got a chance for a very fun end to the season here, but he's not the only player to watch for this homestand. I'll tell you what to watch for in a couple of other guys coming up next. We are in the final homestand for the Cincinnati Reds in 2024, and that means there are some great opportunities to take advantage of on Prize Picks. Just download the Prize Picks app today and use the promo code LOCKDOWNMLB. This will be your first advantage that you can take of, and that is you'll get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even have to win. But with that $5, you can put together an entry that includes guys like Ellie De La Cruz getting more steals like we just talked about, maybe even getting more home runs, maybe seeing uh, some other guys hitting some home runs and things like that. Because all you have to do is you pick your favorite players, pick your favorite stats, click more or less, and put together at least two picks for your entry. And in some cases, four picks can win you up to 100 times your money. That's the Prize Picks app and the promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-M-L-B to get $50 when you play $5. That's Prize Picks. Run your game. We are talking Cincinnati Reds here today and every day, every week, every month, all year long. Make sure that you subscribe to get at least 30 minutes of Reds talk every single day here on the Lockdown Reds podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every single day. And what we're talking about today is this final homestand, just six games left at Great American Ballpark for the season. I am very bummed to say that there are only six games left at Great American Ballpark for the season. Um, it's it's funny because until a team is mathematically eliminated, the uh, idea of purchasing tickets for the playoffs still remains on that team's like game time page. Company guy, game time. Um, so like if you go on game time and you go to purchase a ticket for one of these final six games, you'll also see that it says TBD at Great American Ballpark for the wild card round. It just makes me a little bit sad. Makes me a little bit sad to see that because I thought the Reds would be there. But let's look at a couple of individual achievements to keep an eye on in this home series because we're talking about the long ball for a couple of different guys. Can Spencer Steer finally hit number 20? It has been a long time coming. Let me tell you, he hasn't homered since August 21st in Toronto. Not, a easy, not, not an easy place to hit a home run, but Spencer Steer, it's, it's, we talked yesterday. I'm not going to get into it again. You can go check out yesterday's episode, but Spencer Steer has had a down year, but he could still get to that 20 homer mark and at least feel a little bit good about that number. With one more home run, that's all he has to do. We talked about Ellie, he has to hit like six more homers to get to 30. Steer just needs one in these final, hopefully he does it here in the this homestand, but final 11 games of the season, see if he can get to 20. Another fun home run thing, can Tyler Stevenson get to 20? He's at 18. See if both Steer and Stevenson hit, you know, if Stevenson hits two homers this homestand, and Steer hits one homer this homestand, then you'll have four Cincinnati Reds players who've hit 20 home runs this year because Jamer Candelario got to 20 before he hit the IL. So we'll still kind of be close. I wouldn't say we're, we're okay, we're not close, but we'll still be somewhere in the ballpark of where I thought they'd be power-wise because I said they'd have like five guys hit at least 20 homers. They'll only have four. And part of that reason is TJ Friedel just hasn't played a whole lot this year. TJ Friedel could have been that guy. In fact, consider the fact that TJ Friedel has 13 home runs right now, and Jonathan India has 14 home runs, and TJ Friedel's played about half as much as Jonathan India has this season. TJ Friedel could have been flirting with 25, even 30 home runs had he been healthy all year. Maybe not 30, but anyway. 
I'm getting way ahead of myself. What I'm saying is the home run totals for some of these guys are where I thought they would be. Other guys, they're just way, way off. And, and, and that's really been a thing, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit. The, the power has just been so inconsistent and, 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 quite frankly, a problem for this lineup this year. That's got to be something that they fix in the offseason. We'll talk about that a lot during the offseason. But outside of the homers thing, I'm looking at Noel V. Marte. I don't know that Noel V. Marte can really do anything in this homestand, let alone these final 11 games, to show me that he deserves to be penciled in as the opening day starter next year. But can he salvage some stuff? Can, can he, and, and some of this might be, sound a little bit sarcastic, but can, can he draw two walks? Just give me two more walks. Get to 10. He only has eight walks this year. He actually has eight doubles and eight walks. I don't know the last time I saw somebody that had as many doubles as they had walks, if not more doubles than walks. And that would be crazy. Like, that's a free-swinging dude. Noel V. Marte just swings the bat a ton and doesn't have great plate discipline. That's got to be something that he works on. That is something that has killed him this year. And, and one of the big reasons why we are looking at him as a possible Louisville bat to start the year next season. And, and we had, albeit prematurely, penciled him in as part of the core for the future. Now, we're not even sure he should be in the major leagues. It's definitely been a bad year for him. I mean, can he hit another home run? I just want to see some power out of Noel V. Marte. Consider this for the season. He has a 202 batting average, a 243 on base, and a 304, I think is what it was. Or, or is it under 300? It's, I should have wrote this down. It's right around 300 for the sluggy. All of those are horrible numbers. But I, I just... That's that's something that has really bummed me out about him. And can he keep that batting average above 200? Would love to see if he could do that. But Noel V. Marte is a guy that I'm still keeping my eye on because can he just do something to impress me? He's done a lot to make me concerned for his future, for the Reds' future at third base. Do they just move Ellie De La Cruz there and call it a day? Like, what do you do with that position? Because it kind of felt like that was Noel V. Marte's to lose, and he has lost it. There's no bones about that. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to spin this into something that says, "Hey, El, or Noel V. Marte could get his spot back in these final eleven games." He's got a lot of work to do over the next calendar year to really prove that he is a guy going forward. Where I thought maybe he was already a guy after just a tiny sample size last year, a very good and like the four hundred and fifty-seven thousandth reminder of don't get enamored with small sample sizes in baseball. But also on this homestand, the pitching. Oh, the pitching. There's one big question mark, and that is the fact that supposedly Hunter Green will be back against the Pirates. Not exactly sure what day it'll be, and this could kind of mess up something that I would like to see. If, If Hunter Green pitches on Sunday, that's fine. Or if he pitches on Friday, that's fine. But based on the last time that Rhett Lauder pitched and the last time that Paul Skeens pitched for the Pirates, we could have a Saturday matchup between Rhett Lauder and Paul Skeens, the two top pitching draft picks from last year. That would be a phenomenal theater. I'm not sure how it would go. Paul Skeens has looked really, really good this year. In fact, according to Baseball Reference, even though he's only made 21 starts, he has almost as much wins above replacement as Hunter Green does. Five and a half war for uh, for Paul Skeens this year. But he's been phenomenal. Rhett Lauder has looked really good and been really fun to watch from, from where I'm sitting in his limited time here in the major leagues this season. I would love to see that matchup. Give us that matchup. And, and we'll see it a lot in the future. But we haven't seen it yet this year. What's the first matchup between Rhett Lauder and Paul Skeens going to look like? I think it'd be interesting to see that. And, and it lines up for, you know, the, the regular rest for both of these guys, lines up that they would face each other on Saturday. I want to see that, see if it happens. But Hunter Green's supposed to come back. Hopefully that's either on Friday or Sunday. I don't know that I agree with it. We've, we talked about that ad nauseum Steve and I did last week. Don't love that idea, but I guess the Reds are married to the fact that they're going to get him at least one more start before the season ends. 
Another guy that I'm looking at from the pitching side of things is can Alexis Diaz stay perfect in September? I said it. He's been perfect. And quite frankly, there's a lot of folks that think I just jinxed him. I have no control over what Alexis Diaz does. But in six innings pitch, six appearances in the month of September, he has five strikeouts and nothing else. No base runners allowed, no runs allowed, no hits allowed, no nothing. Nobody's gotten on base against him. He has been perfect since September began. And the number of times that I've said perfect in the last like minute probably means he's going to give up like a billion runs in his next appearance. But I've been happy to see that because we have been missing this Alexis Diaz all year long. There's not been a dominant stretch for him. It feels like he had two or three good games and then he would have three or four clunkers. That's why his statistics for a relief pitcher don't look all that great this year. His strikeout rate is down. His walk rate is up. He's given up more hits, a lot more hits, given up some hard contact. He does keep the ball on the ground for the most part, but when he doesn't, man, they, they go a long way. So I want to see him continue this. Can he finish off the season strong? Maybe finish off the season with a perfect stretch for the entire month of September. That'll be fun to talk about in the offseason. And one other pitching piece, and this is this is a cool one. This is an unexpected one. Because the Reds signed Nick Martinez to kind of be a go-between pitcher this season. They give him starter money, but they started him out in the bullpen. But they said, you're going to start some games. Well, here recently, he has been conscripted into being an every-fifth-day guy because the starting rotation has been so hurt. And he's going to make his 10th start against the Pirates, I think, at some point this weekend. It'll be his 10th start of the of this stretch and this stretch has been phenomenal for him in his last nine appearances, which are all games started. He has 49 and a third innings with a 2.92 ERA. Yeah. That ERA starts with the number two. And he also has 41 strikeouts to just eight walks. Opposing hitters are only getting on base 27% of the time against Nick Martinez It's getting hot in here. It lines up that he starts on Friday. That ju- It just depends on what they do with Hunter Green. Nick Martinez could start on Friday, uh, Friday so I thought I'd drop a Nelly thing in there. I don't know much Nelly. That's that's about as, as much of, of Nelly that I know. But, hey, look, there is lots to watch in this homestand, and I'm going to be glued to the TV set. You know that every single day we're going to be talking about it right here on Locked on Reds because we got 30 minutes of Reds talk for you every single day. But – Going to end this on a little bit of a realistic note because the Reds haven't taken advantage of their home field advantage at all this year. I'll explain why coming up next. And we are nearing the playoffs, which means you can take a couple of great futures over at FanDuel on some other teams. Like if you think the Brewers are going to go far, if you think they're going to get knocked out in the first round, if you think that, you know, maybe the Mets might make the World Series or the Braves, depending on who gets that final wild card spot, FanDuel is the place to go for that. Plus, now through September 22nd, you can place a $5 wager and you can get three free weeks of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV just for placing that $5 wager. That's over at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Plus, you can check out all of the great stuff when it comes to NFL wagers and things like that as well. Like if you think the Bengals are going to bounce back in a big way like I do this coming week, FanDuel is the place to go. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to get three free weeks of NFL Sunday ticket with a $5 wager. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. You can catch every pitch of the Reds' hometown broadcast for the rest of this year and every year on SiriusXM. Just download the SXM app and search the word Reds, and you can take the Reds' hometown broadcast everywhere you go. Well, the Reds are at home for the next six games, their final six home games of the season, and 2024 has not been kind to the Reds at GABP. We always talk a lot about the fact that the Reds have a hitter's ballpark. It is a launching pad, home runs, should be able to score a lot of runs and things like that. They haven't taken advantage of it this year. In fact, they've been outscored 354 to 332 at home. They've been outscored by 22. Now, they're 37 and 39 at home, so it's not as if they're losing every game, but 
with the way that this is set up, the Reds should be launching home runs out of the ballpark and scoring lots of runs against their opponents. But they aren't doing that. In fact, the Reds are just seventh in Major League Baseball in home runs that have been hit at home. They've hit 95 home runs as a team at Great American Ballpark this season. The Dodgers are first with 120. Now, part of that is obviously the Dodgers have a little bit more talent on their team, so that helps. And then, but then here's the other one San Diego is fifth. And they have 101 home runs. They have six more home runs than do the Reds at their home ballpark. And Petco is not a launching pad, the last I saw. But I, I, I looked at that list and I was confused because the Reds should be top three every single year, I believe. I, I think that unless they are just completely punting and unless they are just completely okay with fielding a power deficient lineup on purpose, the Reds should be top three in homers hit at home every single year. But they're number seven in Major League Baseball this season. Don't love that. Let's take it a step further. Let's look at slugging percentage. They're just not just home runs, but the ability to hit extra bases, period. The Reds are 13th in slugging percentage at home. They're only slugging 406 as a team at GABP. The Diamondbacks, meanwhile, they're the, the team that's doing this the best. At home for Arizona, they're slugging 456. They're slugging 50 points higher than the Reds. Part of that is they're a little bit cavernous outfield that they can hit doubles and triples in, but they don't lead the league in either one of those categories. They're just consistently good at hitting extra bases and the reds aren't and, and, and they should be at home. They should be, I I'm, this will be something that I say for every season going forward. It's not really something that I thought I had to say. It's not really something I thought I had to think about, but the reds should be top three because you can argue, argue that Colorado should hit more home runs in their home ballpark than anybody else, which oddly enough, that's not the case. They're lower than the reds. But just, you know, physics and geography and all that other stuff. Colorado should be first. The Yankees should be second. The Yankees are higher up than the Reds. I'm surprised that the Dodgers are the first team. But it helps that you have Shohei Otani and Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman all on the same team. I get that. But just the fact that the Reds are not in the top three should show Nick Crawl in the front office that they got to go get power this offseason. Or, or maybe you put... I don't know, a bionic arm on Christian Encarnacion's strand? I, I don't know how that would work. I'm not really a scientist, but the Reds need more power. Meanwhile, when you flip the script and you look at how the Reds pitch at home, well, this is expected because if you're a pitcher coming to the Reds, you know one thing, do not let the ball fly because when it does, it's going to go out. That's just how it goes at Great American Ballpark. The Reds have actually been out homered at home because the Reds have allowed the third most home runs at home. They're in the top three, but on the pitching side of things, on the home runs allowed side of things, they've allowed 98 home runs. So they've only hit 95 and they've allowed 98 at home. Losing in that. And um, this is another harrowing thing. They're just two away from the top spot. 100 home runs allowed at home by the Chicago White Sox. A team that you could almost argue is not a quadruple A team. It is a triple A team trying to play in the major leagues. And then we take it a step further. We look at the whole slugging percentage thing. Reds pitching has allowed opponents to slug 433 against them at Great American Ballpark. Again, top five. But again, they're getting out slugged. They slug 406 at home. Opponents slug 433 at home. That's the number that the Reds should have. The Reds should be even higher than that. I mean, if the Diamondbacks can slug 456 at their home ballpark, the Reds should be able to slug around 440 with their lineup that, albeit probably isn't as good as Arizona, but I don't know that there's a huge gap there. I don't think that we're talking about the Dodgers and the Reds. We're, we're talking about the Diamondbacks and the Reds. That's not a big difference, but it's worth 50 points on the slugging scale. At home, there's just been a lot of inefficiency, and, and that's been the biggest issue. And, and I'm not, I, I don't talk about attendance because, quite frankly, I can't control who spends what. 
And I know that it's expensive for families to go to the ballpark, and I'm never going to harp on attendance and stuff like that at the ballpark. But if you want to know why it's low, it's because the Reds don't play well at home. They should. They should own it. They should score a ton. This should be a big advantage for them, and it's been a detriment. And I think that that's got to be something and stick on the back of even ownership's mind as we go into this offseason. And I know. And there's going to be an episode that we do coming up soon because there's a lot of folks that like to complain about ownership every single day. I get it. You could. That's just the way professional sports goes. We don't do that here because we like to talk about baseball. But there will be an episode this offseason where we kind of break down our thoughts on all of this because owning a baseball team for a lot of folks is a revenue generator. It is a profit maker. And if you treat it like that, That's why you get these teams that aren't always competitive. But they have to be looking at this and saying, attendance has been down overall. We really should be rising. The team should be better. We should be winning more. They should be in the playoffs. And with all of that, you get more attendance. So what are you going to do about that for 2025? Well, that's going to end us for us today. Thank you so much for checking out the Lockdown Reds podcast with me here today. Steve will be back with us here coming up soon. Our schedules have been all wonky, uh, but make sure that you subscribe to the podcast that we get 30 minutes of Red Stock every single day in your feed. Uh, thanks for making us your first listen as always. Now make your second listen Locked On MLB as Sully gets you ready for the playoffs. Got a link to that in the description of today's episode. Make it easy for you so you don't have to go searching for it. But that'll do it for us here today. Thanks as always for checking out Locked On Reds because we will be Locked On Reds every single day.